Hello readers. Welcome to uh, Tompkins Square Park. It's a uh, spring day. Things are getting green. Renewal. Life going on. Now I'm going to sort of talk about life going on as I discuss this book. Pema Kodron. Pima Kodron. Cho Children, how we live is how we die. How we live is how we die. Now, I take that as, as a valid, uh, that it is true that how we live is how we die. Um, and it's, uh, it's talking about her life personally and that she's, old, I guess, and she's in her 80s, and getting prepared uh, for death. Uh, now, I, I, I think I've been getting sort of prepared for my death the whole time, um, and uh, now that I'm getting older, I'm getting prepared for my death as well, although I'm not as old as this person who is actually a New Yorker. Uh, she's uh, married and had a, ch had a child and uh, later became an initiate with the uh, Tibetan Buddhists and, uh, you know, got on with the Tibetist, Tibetan Buddhist religion, so it's based on Tibetan Buddhist religion. Um, you know, all her most of the uh, practices and thoughts she shares in the book are from her, you know, whatever, 50 years of uh, being involved with Tibetan Buddhism and all these teachers that she keeps uh, naming and uh, referencing and quoting, most of which are named Rinpoche and most of which are male. <clears throat> Now, I was raised as a uh, Christian in uh, Middle America, a non-denominational non Christian church, which uh, I accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior at the age of 10 years old as if I knew what I was doing at age 10 years old, as if any child knows what they're doing when they're 10 years old or very young, and says, yeah, I'm going to be that, I'm going to be this, or I feel like this, or I feel like that. Anyway, that's another argument. Um, so, a big appeal and a big primer and motivator of the Christian thing at least as I understood it, nice tree. The Christian thing, as I understood it, was that um, we were in the game of life ever out, everlasting. Uh, and life everlasting, no matter what. It didn't matter how you behaved in order to get this life everlasting. It's just the way it was all set up that life is going to go on. We do this and then we do the next thing, uh, which, you know, if you're, uh, we all know the, the game. If you're good, you go to heaven. If you're not good, you go to hell and you get tormented for eternity. In heaven, you get to live in uh, peace at the uh, side of uh, God and Jesus for eternity. Either option to me, uh, as I got on in years, uh, became less um, desirable. I don't know how they can keep selling people uh, the everlasting life thing uh, as a uh, motivator for organizing in people into religions. It's like... Uh, this is that great that you want it to go on like forever? And there are elements of that in this book 
and in uh, the Tibetan Buddhist philosophy as it comes down through her and into me and now off to you in this muddled telephone game what I get is that uh, in a way the Tibetan Buddhist thing is a, a little bit of a game of everlasting life as well um, it's a uh, thing where You, you do get to go to the blissful zone of, well, kind of non-life, I guess, it's sort of uh, back into the soup or something, if you, are, uh, if you are good, if you do certain types of practices that uh, benefit your spiritual development and uh, let you let loose of all this life as we know it here. So, that way we have a, a whole package of things we can sell that uh, you know keep, make help build a religion and help build leaders and teachers and all these things the structure the human structure of this philosophy based on you know something that might be ultimately kind of pure but uh, you know a structure is built around it to preserve it and she bought into the structure at a certain point out of a uh, the the hippie movement i guess is what she she says at one point that she was kind of a hippie who got into this stuff which was you know a, a lot of people were back in that time i blame ram das uh, richard alpert for a lot of that because uh you know instead of just being a voyager and seeing where things took everything, he kind of backed off and went, wait a minute, this is really this. This is really this um, Hindu thing. This is not uh, something uh, new and something we can explore. Let's all go back into the uh, core religious thing of Hinduism, this exotic religion and uh, so he was a rich boy and came home and uh, ended up doing these uh, retreats in his dad's yard who his dad owned a railroad company or something I'm sure he was a, a wonderful man so A lot of the uh, uh, pointers in this book is to how you live to how you die, is how, how you die is how you uh, give up, how you let go of the things that are around us, the things that attach us to this realm, uh, you know, the normal Buddhist non-attachment that we Westerners uh, associate with Buddhism. Personally, <laughs> I'm a rarely kind of non-attached person and, um, you know, I'm kind of opposite in, in a, it's not a, not a moral stance and not a good thing, but I uh, run away and flee from attachments. So uh, when it comes to the time when I'm really facing the death part, part of my life, which is part of life, it's all in the bargain. You are all, you're going to die. Sorry to tell you this, but it's true. So I don't think I'm going to go wait a minute, I just want one more day, I want, can, I mean, I don't, I don't even, I kind of go along with the, uh, the notion of uh, an article that was printed in uh, the Atlantic, I think, uh, in 2014, which I revived recently uh, when I was trying to be friends with somebody, it didn't work out very well because I brought up stuff like this. Uh, it was about how the man who was a doctor uh, in 2014 was considering, uh, you know, what goes on in old age and uh, how he did not intend to take 
any particular treatments after 75, which means, uh, you know, we don't get flu shots, we don't get the chemotherapy, we don't get the uh, bypasses, we don't get whatever, because it's not really that great of a bargain to keep the body alive and then end up, you know, not being able to know who you are or who your friends are or what you're doing and having to be cared for. And, you know, I, I don't want to be a burden on the system that I haven't really contributed to very much. It's just, I'm not entitled to it. So, I, I uh, go by that philosophy. So I, I don't really understand. I saw her interviewed um, about this book at the Omega Institute, and there was a, one of the director guy from Omega who's been battling cancer for several years, who was in interviewing her, and a lot of his, a lot of the conversation was about him and his issues. And you know, I was wondering, well, why are you battling the disease? Why, why are you taking these various treatments, these high-tech, uh, expensive, probably? Uh, modern treatments uh, if you know you're going to die anyway and maybe you should be preparing in some other way instead of doing all this you know radical stuff to uh, keep chugging along <clears throat> I do think there's other, other things about this that, that, that just don't make sense to me like uh, she talks about in uh, uh, when others die and your friends uh, so forth so the Tibetan Book of the Dead uh, suggests that you read to them uh, these passages from the uh, Book of the Dead to help them uh, go off into the next cycle uh, you know, there's, she talks about all these various things that the, the teachers talk about. You know, you, you see these kind of lights, you see, you know, all these reports from the other side, which, you know, nobody's really been dead and come back and tell us all this stuff. So, you know, we kind of into the realm of seers now, which is always a little bit tricky. So, This is the part where, where you, you, you are supposed to um, read to the person for 40 days. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, 40 days, that means something to you, to the reader. It means absolutely nothing to the person who is dead. Now say something goes on after they're dead. Oh, is, it also goes on in time? It's also in the timeline like we're in? So 40 days matters to somebody who is dead? Or isn't, uh, isn't, don't we go into, don't we even get the timeless zone after we die? Do we still have to deal with time? That's, that's pretty rude. So, you know, as you can see, I don't take any of this really all that seriously because it's just too, it's too out of control and too uh, overblown with seriousness to take seriously. It's like, okay, so I'm going to die. So fucking what? <laughs> I mean, um, I haven't really known how to live. I hope I can know a little bit better about how to die. And I think that is actually letting go of things, say, being willing to say goodbye to things, any, anything. The book is just about this angst of holding on. If you can get out of the angst of holding on, I think you're going to have a happier life whether you're dead or not. Uh, because desire, wanting more, the sort of wanting, wanting is the, is the part that, that uh, trips us up, I think. Like, uh, you know, I, I, if I don't want something, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, anxious about anything. So, yeah, I read stuff like this. I'm reading a novel now. I'm reading Ohio, which is kind of a dark 
novel from where I came from. But this, uh, you know, I do read stuff like this occasionally. I think it's, I think it's useful. Uh, I think there's a lot to be gained of, uh, out of uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead sort of ideas about things, especially as opposed to the Christian things, which, which I, I, I really have a hard time finding anything to attach to with that as being important or really relevant to anything in my life. You know, other than charity, being kind to others, but you know, all that is just basically human philosophy and being a good citizen, isn't it? So, how we live is how we die. Now, I'm fairly content with my philosophical notions about how I'm living. I'm probably a little too non-attached, which probably hurts others a great deal and does hurt me sometimes because I do feel attachments and then I break away from them and then, then I feel pain because I'm not uh, there anymore. So, and they're not there anymore. But, you know, I don't miss anything from the past, you know, past lives. Yeah, I've had past lives. I was a, I was a child once. I was a, I was a teen once. I was this kind of person once. I was that kind of per- I've had lots of different sorts of lives where I stayed me. But after I die, I really don't want to have to take the personality w- along with me. The idea of the, the, of what this is, this body, this consciousness that comes out of this brain, uh, separated separated from this tree, which is another type of life. The idea that this is all going to chug along in uh, some kind of future realm for eternity or uh, some kind of well, I guess they still have time if you have to read for 40 days, um, is not really something that is desirable to me, so I'm not going to hold on at the, at the point of, I'm going to go like, what's going to happen now? All right, am I going to like bliss out into the soup? Is it going to be scalding hot or is it going to be chilly and lovely? Is it going to be... A white light, or is, you know, she talks about these colors. Uh, you you can get drawn into colors that bring you back into a, another life that you don't necessarily want. If you you know get distracted by the colors instead of going forward into this uh, other thing. Anyway, there is my muddled review of Pima Condorons. Children's, Pima Children's. I did look up a, a YouTube. I look at YouTube if I can't pronounce words, uh, names, and I did look at uh, Pima Children. I think is what the, most of them were saying. So that's my muddled review and my muddled take on uh, religion for this Sunday morning in the springtime of 2023. As a little uh, postscript or coda here, I wanted to say that there's a really good movie on uh, YouTube here by the National Film Board of Canada about the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh, and it's uh, narrated by Leonard Cohen. So I'll provide a link to that, and uh, you might want to watch that instead of watching me or in addition to watching me. Oh, and like and subscribe. I uh, always forget to say, like and subscribe, like and subscribe, because I find it just uh, annoying. I mean, it's, uh, why am I here pitching for uh, YouTube, Google Alphabet, and uh, their product when, you know, I think I'm just going to benefit from it some because some people are going to watch my videos more or I'm going to become a partner and make money out of it. So I hate the, I hate that whole game and I'm probably never going to become a partner anyway because I have less than 30 
subscribers. I think you have to have a nice personality or be attractive to get more or have something really interesting to say that people really have to hear about, uh, like the latest movie or something like that. Like and subscribe.